I'm Stephen Pfeiffer. I'm a William Perry Fellow here at uh, CSAC. And it's my pleasure to introduce this, which is our first session of the European Security Initiatives Speaker Series, the first session of the 2019-2020 uh, academic year. Now, one of the two or three key themes of the European Security Initiative is to look at the kind of threat, the security threat, that Russia poses to Europe and the West. And that's not just a threat in military terms. Uh, we'll talk in the next several, several weeks about the political threat, about use of disinformation and the cyber conflict, but it's also an economic concern. Uh, Russia today is the world's third largest producer of oil. It's the second largest producer of natural gas, and it exports a large amount of that energy to Europe. So uh, Europe today can, gets about 30% of its oil from Russia and between 35 and 45% of its natural gas from Russia. And that creates a certain dependency and the question is, does that dependency create leverage for Moscow? And what kind of risk is there that Moscow will in fact use that dependency? So I'm delighted today that we have Dr. Agnia Grigas to talk to us about these questions, the new geopolitics of energy. She's a strategic advisor on energy and geopolitics. She's associated with the Atlantic Council, the Argonne National Laboratory, the McKinnon Center for Global Affairs at Occidental, the Vilnius Institute for Policy Analysis and LitGas and she holds a PhD from Oxford. She's also author of the book, The New Geopolitics of Natural Gas. Uh, if you're interested, there are copies available uh, outside. And what she's going to do is on the basis of that book, walk us through the sorts of ways that Russia could use that energy dependency that Europe has, that it could use that for political purposes, and then talk a little bit about how the West and the United States should be prepared to resist that. So again, the floor is yours. So first of all, it's a real pleasure to be here today, a real honor. It's, uh, I was here, here last summer at Stanford and, uh, you know, uh, speaking uh, for the Baltic Studies 50th anniversary, um, loved it and, you know, very happy to be back here again. Uh, just a little bit about myself also, I'm uh, Lithuanian born, um, so at the time when it was still part of the Soviet Union, and I think that naturally has... Um, you know, created a, that has been, you know, a research interest in this region, in Eastern Europe, Russia, Eurasia. I've also been based in Los Angeles, so I grew up in Los Angeles, and now I'm based in Los Angeles, so, you know, it's always great to be in California uh, and here at Stanford. So today, uh, my comments will be uh, largely derived from the research of my newest book, The New Geopolitics of Natural Gas, and uh, we will focus on Europe and Russia, but today when we look at the global energy markets, the United States, in fact, is playing a very significant role. Um, Steve mentioned that Russia is the second largest natural gas producer. It's the third largest oil producer. And who's number one? Shout out. The US. That's right, the United States. So if we're having this conversation really on the geopolitics of energy, ge geopolitics of natural gas, we have to mention that the situation has transformed significantly. And the, today, the United States is uh, an energy superpower, as I call it. Um, and that's why when, you know, today, in the, well, in the recent weeks in the news, we've seen uh, the conversation between President Trump and President Zelensky. Part of, the, of understanding it is also is understanding it in this background of broader uh, global energy markets. So let's get started. Um, the, the basic premise of this book is that uh, uh, the global energy markets have transformed uh, with the North American shale boom, basically with uh, extraction of uh, um, unconventional shale gas resources and also shale oil, shale oil resources in the United States. And the United States has really been a pioneer in this field, but you know, other countries that are doing it are also Canada, China, though uh, to still much, much smaller quantities, um, and Argentina. And uh, why gas? Why did I choose to write about gas, let's say, rather than oil? Um, oil has uh, been receiving a lot more attention from generally from policymakers, from statesmen, uh, really probably since the oil crisis uh, of the 70s. Uh, but uh, gas, in fact, has been, in my view, a much more politicized commodity uh, because it has been a commodity that's uh, difficult to transport in the past. In the past, it was only transported by land-based pipelines. Um, 
So that created long-term relationships um, between exporting and importing countries and was really kind of geographically uh, you know, and geopolitically based. Uh, now, uh, with, these, uh, with these change in the, in the markets, we've seen this transformation of the gas markets. And I argue that this is creating changes in relations between the gas importing and exporting states. In the past, really, the largest gas importer in the world was uh, the European Union or European countries taken as a whole. And the largest gas exporter was Russia. So really, the basis of these kind of gas relationships in the past was Europe and Russia. And this relationship lasted for more than 50 years. So from the height of the Cold War to really pretty much, you know, even almost up to present day until we've seen these changes. So. So what are more of these changes? I mentioned that the US, you know, I mentioned the shale boom that was driven out of North America. Um, there's also growing LNG trade. Now LNG, is that a term you all know? Or <laughs> Raise your hands if you, you know it. I'll, I'll get a sense of, okay, okay, of my audience. Uh, okay, so liquefied natural gas. It's essentially natural gas, but uh, in liquid form now. Uh, created through a process, but the main point here is that you can transport this LNG, liquefied natural gas, in ships, in tankers, similarly as you could transport oil in tankers on the international markets, on the open seas, so you're no longer dependent now on these existing historic, you know, infrastructure, you know, land-based pipeline projects. Um, so, LNG trade has really taken off um, since um, the early 2000, 2000s, 2010s, particularly after the Fukushima disaster, when Japan was in shortage of energy and started importing uh, LNG to meet that demand. And that's when people started talking about the potential of a global gas market. Um, there's also a built up of uh, interconnective gas infrastructure. So those are the more traditional pipelines. Uh, uh, it's, uh, also interconnectors. We've seen a lot of that in Europe, but we've seen also other regions uh, uh, like China, you know, building over the last decade, they've built uh, a number of gas pipelines, uh, the latest of which is, you know, from Russia, but also one from Central Asia, from Myanmar. Uh, we see also India building an, um, a gas pipeline as well uh, from Afghanistan. So much more infrastructure, so much more interconnectedness in these markets. And we also have uh, uh, climate change concerns and natural gas being uh, what is considered a, you know, the cleanest fossil fuel or a clean fossil fuel. Uh, there's a lot of appetite uh, uh, from policymakers and also from the public for gas. So these are, I would say, kind of the key elements in terms of the markets. So, as I've mentioned, uh, in this picture comes really the United States, uh, the new energy superpower, which emerged as the la largest natural gas producer since 2011. Um, before it had competed with Russia, you know, in different historical periods, but really in 2011 with the shale boom, it just surpasses Russia. And it has also emerged as the largest crude oil producer since 2018. Um, also, in 2016, the United States uh, starts taking its gas globally by becoming an LNG, uh, liquefied natural gas exporter. Now, at the time, really in 2016, uh, at that time I was, uh, yeah, maybe starting work on this book, uh, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. Uh, you know, whether American LNG can really, where can it go? Um, there are a lot of discussion that, well, it can't really go to Europe. It can't really compete with Russian piped gas. Um, uh, probably would only go to Asia and so on. Well, really since 2016, we've seen American LNG go across the globe. Uh, we've seen uh, contracts with Poland, with Lithuania, you know, countries that have been traditionally very dependent on Russia for, for gas, you know, 100% dependent on Russia for gas. Uh, through the gas pipeline. So American LNG has proven to be, you know, highly competitive worldwide. And really uh, what we can expect, uh, we can expect the United States, um, according to the EIA estimates, to become the third and soon after the second largest LNG exporter in the world. So surpassing, uh, you know, Australia, competing with Qatar for, in this field. 
here um, I just have a map just so you get an idea. I mean, this is just one region of the United States, the Louisiana, um, the Louisiana Mississippi type of border. Just here we have about 10, 15 LNG export projects. So this kind of, I would say, revolution is not over yet. It's just kind of getting into full swing. So these are the different projects that are being uh, built or planned to export American, uh, American gas worldwide. And here, as I mentioned, uh, uh, where has this American gas gone? Um, so uh, yes, Asia, uh, and particularly China, has been you know, a significant destination. Um, of course, uh, you know, South Korea, Japan, our traditional allies, uh, Mexico, but you know, 34% is really going across, across the world. And uh, before we start heading to Russia and Europe, because maybe I assume you expected to start in Russia and Europe, but I wanted to start with the US so you really understand the full changes uh, that Russia really is facing today in Europe um, coming out from North America. So not only there is now this more abundance of uh, energy sources, both um, natural gas and oil, because the United States now is a, the largest producer. But I would say what's even maybe more significant is that the United States is also changing the way business is done in this, in this sector. So in the past, Gazprom was really kind of the leader, well, of, was the largest gas exporter, the Russian uh, you know, uh, gas monopoly. And the Gazprom like to do, you know, gas deals, you know, more secretively, usually with the, some political strings. Uh, gas was perceived as a type of, you know, commodity that could be doled out uh, to allies and so on. But here what's happening, um, in, and also these were very long term contracts, you know, the decade or longer or several decade long contracts that countries would sign essentially with Russia, with Gazprom for gas supplies. So with the U.S. entering this market, it's changing this business uh, model to, you know, much more commercially based, much more transparent, much more dynamic. Uh, and now we see a lot more short-term contracts versus long-term contracts. So basically the importer, you know, doesn't have to get married to the exporting country for decades. Uh, we also see more hub-based pricing versus oil-linked gas pricing, which has always been very significant to the, uh, to the consumers and the importers, because uh, it more reflects the, the market conditions, the spot market conditions, uh, versus, you know, a, let's say a gas price set, that maybe you set a certain gas price in your contract 15 years ago, but, you know, when you signed that contract, but it doesn't quite reflect the reality today. And of course, there's the growth of LNG in the overall market. In terms of gas being traded overall, LNG keeps growing in proportion every year. Every, every year has been a record year for the last, I don't know, three, four, uh, maybe five years even. And there's no destination clauses, um, a very important factor in EU. So basically, uh, um, it means that an, an importer, when it imports that at gas, can, if it doesn't need to use it, uh, if it has a surplus, it can re-export it to other countries. And that may seem, you know, simple enough and reasonable enough, but actually Gazprom in the past would forbid this, that the gas you imported would have to stay in your territory. And that would allow actually Gazprom to create kind of preferential pricing systems to different countries. So these changes that I would say, you know, you, American energy industry is driving, um, is really creating uh, what, what would be more of a buyer's market, you know, conditions that are much more favorable to importing states. And uh, uh, a lot of, if we look at it more politically, a lot of gas importing states in the world are actually America's allies. So it's the European countries, it's Japan, South Korea. So a lot of, again, the traditional gas importers are our allies, which were in the past really hurt by previous ways of doing business in this, in this market. So, and we have uh, now the, the Trump administration and Mr. Perry, who've uh, from the very beginning been uh, very vocal and not shied away by really, um, you know, with a statement, you know, with uh, policies like energy dominance, uh, uh, basically to use this uh, America's uh, newfound energy superpower in their diplomacy. 
And that's why, uh, you know, President Trump, uh, from his very first meetings um, with foreign leaders, from the very start of his term, he would always essentially bring up, well, how much American gas are you buying? And, you know, if you're buying uh, plenty of American gas or if you have a contract that you're about to, to sign, well, then, you know, let's have a conversation on other issues, this uh, type of uh, style. Um, the United States has received also some pushback from this type of diplomacy and this type of rhetoric, particularly with our allies in Europe. Um, <laughs> no worries. There, um, there's been some pushback in European capitals and maybe Germany saying that, well, you know, maybe you're pushing back, uh, back against Russian gas or projects such as Nord Stream 2. Uh, how many of you know what Nord Stream 2 is? Uh, okay, about maybe half, half. We'll come to it, so a Russian, a Russian gas pipeline. It's only because this is, uh, you know, you only, only because the United States wants to sell more of its gas. So it, I would say, kind of has weakened somewhat uh, uh, the United States' diplomatic standing or its uh, perception um, in diplomatic relations. But in fact, the United States' uh, positions on Europe's energy policy have been very consistent, really going back to the height of the Cold War, where the United States has always uh, sought and promoted energy diversification or reducing reliance on Russian gas uh, among its allies. I mean, naturally, because the United States is uh, the security guarantor for a lot of our allies. Um, so, you know, we've had also energy enter the trade wars um, with, um, you know, China, you know, raising tariffs on uh, or threatening to raise tariffs on American LNG. And there's also now this uh, kind of quid pro quo diplomacy criticism and backlash that the U.S. is facing. Some of it is you know, in relation also to this telephone call, phone call, the infamous telephone phone call now. Um, uh, and I don't know if you read the readout from that uh, co conversation, you know, it was also interesting to note that uh, President Zelensky kind of makes a sentence, well, we're buying American oil, you know, he, that type of thing, you know, he wants to, as I said, this has been part of very much Trump's diplomacy, that countries have to say that they're buying uh, American essentially resources to, you know, have a more favorable conversation. And then he says, well, we're ready to cooperate more, you know, on our energy independence and on natural gas. So, so for example, Ukraine could be one of the countries that could potentially uh, build an LNG import terminal and could potentially import American LNG. Uh, but also Ukraine has its own significant natural gas resources that have, uh, you know, not been efficiently developed. And uh, I mean, probably the most ideal option would be for Ukraine to really boost their own natural gas development domestically, and they could be perfectly self-sufficient at home. So coming to Russia now, um, so what does that mean? You know, I've said the United States is an energy superpower. So does that mean that, uh, you know, Russia is declining energy power, that, uh, um, and what, what does, uh, you know, energy and natural gas still mean for Russia? Um, you know, a lot of scholars, many books have been written on this. Uh, typically, gas was perceived as something uh, in between of a commodity for Russia that it was exporting and a, you know, revenue maker, and also a source of political influence. Um, also more, uh, but a potential source. Uh, also often on the back of these gas deals, there are also you know, elements of corruption or at least uh, suspicions of corruption. Um, so as a gas supplier, uh, Russia has been supplying gas uh, well, to the European Union states again since the height of the Cold War. Um, Gazprom would say it's been overall a, a reliable su supplier. Um, you know, but there are also, you know, uh, critics would uh, disagree. I mean, there's been a number of gas cuts uh, um, to via Ukraine. So in 2004, 2008, and since 2014. So interruptions to supplies to Ukraine. And because Ukraine is the main gas transit country for Russian gas to Europe, uh, therefore, uh, other European countries uh, within the EU would also experience interruptions. Uh, critics have also criticized Gazprom for political pricing, basically saying that, uh, you know, uh, countries like, uh, 
Germany or Belarus, for example, would get more favorable gas pricing versus countries that more spoke out against uh, Russia's foreign policy, like Poland or the Baltic states and so on. There's also, through these gas relationships, the creation of interest groups, uh, middlemen, uh, kind of companies that are distributing that gas. Um, and again, as I mentioned, you know, elements of corruption in this relationship. Um, one, I think, more uh, very interesting element that uh, gas has also served as the means for Putin's gas diplomacy, as a means of creating uh, relationships with other states, particularly in the West. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have Gerard Schroeder here, probably one of the most maybe infamous uh, uh, persons. Uh, this is the former German chancellor who, after after signing a deal with uh, Russia for the Nord Stream 1 for a Russian gas pipeline. Uh, soon then uh, when he left office went on to essentially work for Gazprom and other Russian energy companies. Uh, we have, you know, Erdogan, uh, uh, you know, Turkish leader when uh, another basis of relationship with Russia wanting to build a Turk stream or a pipeline to Turkey, so another gas pipeline. You know, uh, so Silvio Berlusconi, maybe now so some years ago, but he was also kind of that player in Putin's gas diplomacy. More recently, uh, gas has been Russia's, what I would say, calling card in Asia uh, because of the great rise in Asia's gas demand, particularly China um, and in India as well. So the, prom you know, the promise of gas deals all often gets, uh, you know, kind of Russia in the door for those. Um, you know, to boost those relationships. So. so the conclusion, I mean, when it comes to Russia, is Russia a declining energy power? Um, I, I don't think we can quite say that today, really. Um, the United States has been more the, you know, the upstart in here that has entered this, uh, this market and these dynamics. Uh, still, Russia has a monopolist position in many European uh, markets. It still has a political leverage um, in a number of countries that import its gas, though that is increasingly being challenged as importers have a lot more options they can choose from. Uh, Russia also has ambitious LNG plans because they know I think that's where the future lies. Uh, Russia today, surprisingly, given that it was the largest gas exporter in the world, it, it's only number seven. Uh, as an LNG exporter, but it's climbing, uh, you know, the ranks table. And uh, Putin has said that it's his personal, you know, goal and ambition to make Russia the leading, the number one LNG exporter. Well, um, you know, they're kind of starting from, you know, the back of the line a little bit. Let, let's see what he can do. And of course, there are a lot of ambitions for new pipelines uh, in Europe and in Asia. To, I would say, essentially, to lock in their significant customers with these, uh, you know, land-based infrastructure projects. So. And here are a couple of examples. So this is, as I said, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project, um, a lot in the news now. Um, essentially, the Nord Stream 1 project was already built. So it's a pipeline that goes directly from northern Russia under the Baltic Sea to Germany. Yeah. And the essence of this pipeline is essentially, so, you know, it's going through here. So essentially, instead of it's uh, the current, most of the routes go through Belarus or a little bit further south through Ukraine and then onwards to Western Europe. So it's to circumnavigate this, the transit states, and instead have a direct underwater route. Uh, so for Russia, I'd say this is both uh, a political project and a commercial project. Um, Germany is uh, Russia's largest gas importer, in fact, in Europe. So largest quantities of uh, volume of Russian gas are export exported to Germany. And Germany's de demand keeps on uh, uh, growing, or at least it's expected to grow given their uh, you know, renewable, well, given their clean energy um, agenda to reduce efficiency. I, I'm not a fan of this project. I've written extensively about it. Uh, I think it's, well, it really goes against EU's uh, uh, security policy, which calls for diversification of sources and routes. This is the opposite of what this project does. Also, it's a constant, concentrate supplies via one single route. So the, it would be this route now, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. 
um, this region of the Baltic Sea is also, and there's a lot of like underground uh, uh, explosives still left over from World War II. Uh, this would also allow Russian potentially military ships uh, to have more of an excuse to have a larger presence in the Baltic Sea. And I also view this project like we saw, you know, Mr. Gerard Schroeder on the previous slide. I think this type of project would allow also Russia to not only establish closer, closer political ties with Germany, but also to export more corruption. Well done. And another project to consider, this one is less in the news than Nord Stream 2. Uh, but it's a very similar type of project. It's a project to build a gas pipeline from Russia uh, through the Black Sea directly to Turkey, the Turk Stream project. And why Turkey? Well, you know, Turkey is uh, Russia's second largest gas importer in Europe. So you see that Russia is trying to really, I would say, hold on to these two key markets, the first of which being G Germany and the second of which being Turkey. And actually both countries being very significant players kind of in the geopolitics of Europe and Eurasia, two countries that have been traditionally, well, America's allies, where today we can see relations a little bit fractured. So we can see, uh, I think, uh, the Kremlin trying to make inroads with their gas, gas diplomacy here as well with these countries. So what have, what have been some of the successes uh, that we've seen um, given this kind of transformation that, of the energy markets that I described uh, earlier, given the United States role as an energy superpower, as an energy exporter? Well, certainly the success cases are, have been Lithuania, which uh, built its uh, floating LNG import terminal. Uh, and I worked on the early stages of that project. And the country went from being 100% de dependent on Russian gas and being charged the highest gas prices almost in Europe by Russia because you know they could, they had a monopoly on that market and constantly feeling political pressure, essentially saying, well, you know, if you, if you uh, pursue these foreign policies or these domestic policies, then we're gonna raise your gas prices. So um, immediately, even before the construction of this LNG import terminal, Lithuania already got negotiated a discount uh, from Gazprom. And this was simply on the fact that, uh, you know, Gazprom knew that soon Lithuania would have alternatives. And since then, Lithuania has been uh, importing mostly Norwegian gas, um, but also American gas and gas from, uh, you know, Qatar and all over the world. Uh, Poland, another case, uh, there they've built a large stationary LNG import terminal. Uh, with significant volumes. Croatia is a country that has uh, uh, plans for, for a terminal, a uh, very significant country also because it would impact not only the Croatian market, um, but also the whole of Southeast Europe. Um, so uh, Croatia has had plans to build an uh, LNG import terminal. It has earmarked uh, EU funds to do that. But I think uh, Russia also kind of, uh, you know, moved, uh, you know, uh, ahead and in fact um, signed a deal for meeting all of uh, Croatia's 10-year gas demand. Uh, so essentially trying to dampen Croatia's appetite to build this uh, terminal so they could have alternatives. Ukraine is still, I mean, this is a bit, you know, as I mentioned, the Ukraine has a very significant role in the gas business of Europe because it's a transit state. It's also a potential producer. Um, so how Ukraine will turn out, I think we, we still have to watch whether this will be a success case. So. And here on Asia, uh, we touched on this briefly, but um, Asia is really kind of the new center of energy demand, particularly natural gas. And uh, China is the country that's uh, leading that. Um, China has had a very, I would say, thought out uh, and clever policy when it comes to their energy markets and particularly their natural gas. I think they've seen what, you know, the weakness Europe exhibited in its dealings with Russia and Gazprom, and they've uh, pursued a very well diversified um, gas import mix. So they have a pipeline now, new pipeline for the power of Siberia that was built in 2019 from Russia, but they also have a pipeline from Central Asia. Uh, for gas. They also have a pipeline from Myanmar. They also have LNG import terminals where they import from a number of uh, countries in the world, including from the United States. 
and they also have their own very aggressive shale gas development program. They want to replicate the shale boom or revolution that we've had in the United States. Uh, they're still far behind. It's still more of an ambitious project. They've invested tremendous amount of money in it. But uh, I would also say it's probably a question of also time when they will start really kind of bearing fruit. Uh, and what we can also, if we look at uh, the China-Russia relationship when it comes to energy, well, we can see that it's really been China that has had the upper hand in a lot of these negotiations in terms of price, in terms of the routes and the pipeline selected. For, that's why, in fact, the power of Siberia was built, because that's the pipeline China wanted. Russia wanted the power of Altai pipeline. It would have been more convenient for them, but essentially it's been tabled. And through uh, a number of other factors, you can really see that... Uh, you know, kind of, church. I think uh, China is kind of leading in that relationship. Uh, India, um, another country where the gas demand is expected to explode uh, in the coming years. They don't have much existing infrastructure in terms of gas pipelines, but they've also turned to Russia or, or maybe the other way around. Russia has come uh, <laughs> with their gas business card calling and uh, uh, they've uh, basically have plans to build a pipeline from Iran to India, um, the, the Tapi pipeline. Uh, so through Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India, I mean, this has been in the plans and in the works for so many years, but because of the you know, political situation and instability in Afghanistan and also India's Pakistan relationships, uh, there's been some delays, but I, you know, this pipeline will also become a reality it's just, again, a matter of, you know, when. Um, we've spoken a lot about gas, but I wanted to have a slide here on the nuclear, nuclear sec sector, because when, you know, I've been studying Gazprom for, I don't know, almost 10 years or more. And uh, now when I look at uh, what we see with Rosatom, um, so essentially the state-owned Russian nuclear company, I see kind of a similar type of strategy, a similar strategy of expanding uh, Russia's reach across the globe by creating lo long-term infrastructure projects, um, uh, you know, by building nuclear power plants across the world, or then, uh, you know, making deals to supply them with nuclear fuels and so on. Uh, some of these uh, plants, and I mean, this is just some example, you know, Hungary, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Belarus, um, a lot of times these tenders are not uh, run, not, you know, perfectly clearly and transparently. Uh, there's pushback from neighbors or within the, within the domestic state. And uh, uh, an interesting example in Ukraine also, when the United American Westinghouse entered the market and started supplying fuels to, um, to the Ukrainian plants, there was kind of a, a Russian information warfare almost campaign against the company, against American fuel. So, for example, if there would be a power outage in Ukraine, then the, the rumor would start, oh, it's because the Westinghouse fuel, you know, the American fuel is not working or something, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, unrelated, but that type of thing. So I think Rosatom is a company to, to watch as well. And I think uh, its strategy, uh, both commercial and political, very much mirrors that of Gazprom. Um, and before we wrap up, um, I think I've painted both kind of an optim well, an optimistic yeah. picture, but probably not uh, you know fully optimistic because, as I said, there's been a lot of change with the United States entering the markets, changing the business practices, with importers still having a lot of flexibility, and with Russia's ability mm -hmm. to kind of have to strong arm uh, importing countries being more constrained. But there's still, you know, a number of risks in the energy uh, sector and, you know, geopolitics is not dead, certainly in the energy sector. Just a couple, you know, uh, I, I'd highlight because now of this, you know, boom in terms of infrastructure, um, LNG shipping and so on, there is more territory and infrastructure we have to worry about or that you can say the United States and its allies and NATO have to worry about. So, you know, the security of ports, sea routes, terminals, um, um, not just you know the the pipelines of the past there's also cybersecurity when it comes to a lot of this infrastructure and um, uh, from uh, you know cyber crime to malfunctions to potential hostile foreign agents so, 
There's also the role of propaganda that, I mean, I mentioned one example in Ukraine uh, with Westinghouse, but you know, that, uh, that's also a field we cannot kind of forget or ignore. And there's also foreign support, supported lobbies and interest groups that remain strong, that remain strong on existing uh, relationships um, that um, Russia and Gazprom and Rosatom have established over the previous decades. Uh, and as a result, uh, we have to be concerned about their influence on our, you know, from local level to state to national and so on. So, you know, ge geopolitics and geopolitical competition is not dead desp despite the positive changes uh, in the markets. And that wraps us up. Uh, these are my other books, uh, The Politics of Energy and Memory Between the Baltic States and Russia, uh, Beyond Crimea, the New Russian Empire, which really more delves down into Russian foreign policy in its near abroad, and of course, uh, the book we just discussed. So I'm really looking forward to questions, and, uh, and I hope we can have a discussion about it as well. Thank you. Nightmare scenario, although maybe not very likely for Europe, would be if the Russians decide somehow, we're gonna stop the gas flow. And so all of a sudden, 35% of Europe's gas disappears. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen reports saying, though, that there's been considerable construction of LNG receiving facilities in Europe that would allow at least significant parts of Europe to basically to fairly easily substitute LNG for, for uh, Russian gas. Is that so? And how easy and where would the problems be? Mm -hmm. um, certainly. Uh, so Europe has been concerned, well, I would say seriously started getting more concerned and more concretely concerned uh, about the possibility of Russian gas uh, cutoff uh, or shut down since 2004-2005, uh, the first Ukraine gas crisis. And a number, since then, a number of uh, um, reforms or you know, procedures have been put into place uh, as required, as mandated by Brussels. So countries have to have, first of all, gas storage. Um, so that would last them through, you know, I, I forget the exact dates. So there's different dates for how much they would need for the summer months, I think, uh, and versus winter. So uh, a certain time period, um, a month or two, that could get them through. Um, there's also um, the, what I had discussed, the interconnections that, that were built up. So basically interconnectors between the different European gas pipelines. So meaning that, okay, well, if Poland gets shut off, uh, that means Poland can then uh, get gas from Germany, from the other direction. And that has actually been very successful because, uh, and we can see it in particularly in the case of Ukraine, which since 2014, the war um, really and Crimea's annexation was more or less kind of shut off from Russian gas or uh, chose not to import it because the price was just, you know, uh, I don't know, ex extraordinary, extraordinarily high. So Ukraine has been able to import that same Russian gas, but instead of directly from Russia, but, but through its uh, Western neighbors, um, Poland, uh, Slovakia, Austria, you know, the, from the Western Southern, Western Southern neighbors. So basically it's been meet, able to meet all its gas demand just because of this reverse flow or pipeline interconnectors. Um, now it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, the, the risk doesn't remain. Um, you can have short, uh, well, of course, LNG import terminals again. Uh, so of course not all countries can have even LNG import terminals. You have to have coastal access. Uh, it's a significant investment to, you have to have something uh, on your shore that can receive an LNG tanker, then you have to have the capacities to regasify that and send it onwards to your system. So again, not all, all countries can have that. More countries have it now than before. Uh, but you can also have interconnectors, pipeline interconnectors with countries that have these facilities and therefore you know, get, get that gas that way. So I think a lot more has been done. And I would say Russia today probably can't really, I mean, it's not such a credible threat I would say more the European Union could, I mean, still not, they're not quite ready there, but they could more threaten that they would stop buying Russian gas than Russia saying that we will cut off all gas to Europe. You know, also the revenues would be, revenue losses would be tremendous for Russia. Uh, Russia has really tried to diversify away from dependence on European revenues for their gas towards the Asian markets, but you know, they, they haven't come full way there. But you know, nonetheless, uh, 
if they wanted to create a disruption, especially to a specific country, not the European Union as a whole, they could still do so. Okay. Let me open up the floor to questions. Mike? So many. <laughs> uh, Michael Paul Stanford, yes. could you tell us a bit more in depth about uh, US Ukraine policies with respect to natural gas? Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you alluded to some yes. of it, right? So they don't have an LNG terminal, so no. we're not exporting. Mm -hmm. But uh, Secretary Perry's been playing a big role in our policy mm -hmm. lately. He was the head of the uh, committee for the inauguration of President Zelensky. Mm -hmm. It sounds like they've been talking to Naftogaz about mm -hmm. changing their policies. Or could you just, to the best of your abilities, I know it's a moving story, but it's a pretty complicated one. What yes. are the objectives of the Trump administration vis-a-vis -vis our energy policy <laughs> towards Ukraine? And I, I, I mean, at the, well, you answer it any way you want. I, <laughs> but I'm just curious as to what's going on. What is the actual play that's going on? Is there something, well, that, you mm -hmm. get my question. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be you know, um, of course, there's several ways or several approaches, you know, I, um, I could come from different angles on this, but um, one I would say, well, it's, I don't know to what extent, um, you know, the leadership of US, you know, US leadership and policymakers uh, on, uh, you know, their policy towards uh, energy policy towards Ukraine know the full picture. Um, I think since the start of Trump administration, as I mentioned, there's been this broad policy of, uh, you know, we're just gonna export our LNG as much as possible everywhere and this will you know be good for our economy jobs and revenues um and we'll also do kind of similarly gas diplomacy you know kind of this will be a, almost a quid pro quo type of uh, you know these terms have been used now quite a bit but from the start this was a type of almost quid pro quo diplomacy you know buy our gas and then you know we will talk on other issues uh, with Ukraine, but, to be clear, they yeah. can't buy American gas. but they cannot, they cannot. And well, I have to say, even the idea of um, uh, an LNG, well, first of all, they'd have to have an LNG import terminal. Um, now, you know, honestly, uh, very problematic for Ukraine to have an LNG import terminal because uh, um, the, the tanker would have to go through the Turkish Straits uh, to enter the Ukrainian waters. Uh, um, and the Turkish Straits do not allow for uh, tanker, LNG tanker shipments. So, I mean, this is not something, I mean, first of all, as I said, Ukraine doesn't have this. Um, it would be problematic for them to get it even just because of the Turkish Straits issue. It's a very large investment. This is, uh, you know, starting at several billion dollars, just starting, you know, to build something. Also, is this in Ukraine's uh, really best interest? Um, I mean, yes, if they're, let's, I mean, I would say, well, generally no, because they, they have their own domestic gas producing capabilities, so they would be better off producing their own domestic gas. I mean, it would be an option in terms of some sort of crises, let's say if Russia really turns off gas to Russia, well, then having access to an LNG terminal would be helpful, of course, but again, as I said, there are some problems there with uh, building it uh, uh, on U Ukraine's coastal waters. So. You know, it's not a very kind of clear uh, picture. Maybe part of uh, Perry's uh, strategy was to bring more American expertise to Ukraine's energy sector so that the country could actually start producing um, gas domestically. I mean, that I would say has been kind of a fiasco, honestly, for Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has had tremendous uh, gas fields. In fact, the first Soviet gas that was being exported to Europe during the hei height of the Cold War, that was not Russian gas, that was Ukrainian gas. Um, so, I mean, then the fields were depleted, then they were never properly managed or run. Plus, uh, domestically, Ukraine had, uh, let's say, the, some players, some oligarchs and so on, had more of a benefit, personal benefit from uh, you know, getting, I guess, kickbacks from gas contracts with Russia, with Gazprom, um, and importing thus Russian gas, then developing, uh, you know, Ukraine's own domestic gas industry. So, you know, the picture there is kind of complicated, but uh, I would say more where the U.S. could help Ukraine, again, is with that expertise to develop its own domestic gas industry, like the Burisma Group, uh, for example, 
uh, you know, that again has also been in the news. That's the company that uh, Hunter Biden was on the board. So it's a type of company that produces uh, gas domestically. It's not a very large company. I mean, 400 million revenues, and it produces about 1 20th uh, of Ukraine's domestic production. But, you know, that's, that's the type of, uh, and again, I, you know, an LNG terminal for Ukraine, while nice, you know, in theory, it's probably not like something that they can implement immediately. David? I'll be quicker. David Holloway here. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I was thinking also about, um, and maybe you did hint at this a little bit, what are Russia's <coughs> vulnerabilities in, in this area? Because during the Cold War, reliance on oil exports mm -hmm. was a vulnerability mm -hmm. used mm -hmm. by the US in terms of manipulating the price of oil. But maybe the gas market is so international that that's not a possibility, is it? Or, I mean, I'm just trying to think. Mm -hmm. um, you talk mainly about, uh, uh, say, European vulnerabilities being reduced over the years mm -hmm. by measures that have been taken. And I'm wondering whether, uh, given the importance of gas and uh, of energy exports in the Russian economy, is a sense of vulnerabilities there? Um, the, certainly, the, there's a sense of vulnerability, and many w would have immediately, when you start speaking, let's say, of Russia's gas weapon, well, uh, many would point to immediately, well, maybe Russia is the more vulnerable one because it's, uh, you know, dependent on uh, gas, you know, or energy revenues. Uh, here, I would uh, uh, separate out, uh, in fact, Russia earns more from oil than it does from gas. So gas is much less significant, I would say, in its, uh, you know, as a contributor to its state budget. And uh, gas I, has played much more of that kind of political, diplomatic, um, you know, influence role. I think that's where it's, the strength lay. But uh, still, you know, uh, Europe has been Russia's primary market for gas exports since uh, Russia's energy strategy of 2020, written for, you know, 2020. They've um, made a point that they will diversify, that they will seek Asian markets. That hasn't quite panned out. I mean, the Chinese really squeezed them. I, I don't know if they're making, I, I don't know if they're losing money on that, honestly, on, on, on that deal or making money. I mean, hard to say. But uh, so th they do indeed kind of remain somewhat vulnerable. And uh, if you look at Europe as a whole, I mean, now with Nord Stream 2, there's these arguments by, you know, Gazprom lobbyists and their friends that Europe's gas demand is going to grow and therefore you need Nord Stream 2. I mean, personally, you know, all the research I look at, not from Gazprom and friends, but uh, I don't see any of those types of uh, analysis. In fact, I mean, my view would be that Europe's gas demand has, you know, at best plateaued and if not decreasing. So, because again, Europe's focused on renewables and so on and on. So. <laughs> sure. So I actually wanted to pick up a great talk again, and um, and I'm looking forward to reading the book. Um, so I'm thinking about Germany, obviously, in the, in Nord Stream Two, mm -hmm. and and it's it's paused right now, right, because of sanctions. So I mean, this seems to me to be a way that Russia is quite disruptive in Europe, right? So the goal is really to disrupt relations between European. States, and you said, and, and perhaps disrupt the EU, and you noted, you know, this is this is actually against European energy, mm -hmm. stated European energy policy. Yet Germany is still going ahead mm -hmm. with it. So can you can you talk a little bit about how, you know, Russia has used gas in particular to try and um, try and be a disruptive power in in Europe, and and you know, aside from this seemingly corrupt relationship with Gerhard Schroeder. Um, who in Germany is still supporting Nord Stream? There's, there's still powerful lobby groups and interest groups and some politicians, especially re, uh, regional politicians also for that region where the Nord Stream 2 pipeline would land. Um, they really support the pipeline. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think uh, when you say uh, Russia as a disruptor with the gas markets, I think it's, uh, it can be less of a disruptor today, as I mentioned, by threatening to shut off the gas, but it can very much be a disruptor to 
democracies, uh, to you know, capitalist states through these uh, kind of corrupt deals and. Uh, because you know, at the end of the day, it's uh, it's not that hard to buy off an individual, let's say, let's say versus to change a whole state's uh, policy. But then that person can be influential in changing policies. I, I was in uh, in the region where, uh, not far from Hamburg, uh, on the Baltic Sea, where the 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 Russian pipeline would land, and there in that re in that region. Uh, Nickelberg, oh, I'm forgetting the exact the exact name. It's a very small town, and there they even have uh, parades, Russia Day. You know that uh, they're being organized, and uh, and it's being presented as that this is something that's going to bring jobs and prosperity to this region. It's in Eastern Germany as well, and uh, you know I've spoken with folks who are you know in the government there, and they say, well, we we know this is a sham because there won't be any jobs. I mean, they have like 10 Russian engineers that they brought in there. You know, it's not like the local, local East Germans uh, are gonna get much benefit out of it. Yeah, um, uh, a comment, first of all, uh, and you were uh, um, Ross out of slide. Mm -hmm. uh, you missed Turkey, and that's the largest energy project, nuclear energy project Russia has in Europe. And my question great is... Great point, great point. I think when I was doing the slide, I was looking at Europe. So, yes, uh, well, European, yes. Yes. Any of the other yes. Uh, my question is, um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the effort to make Russia adhere to the third European energy charter in terms of separating the uh, producer, pipeline producer from the pipelines and from downstream activities? And if that were to be successful, that will take a whole bunch of gas from monopoly position and make it just a, pipe, a producer company rather than a producer plus full downstream mm -hmm, mm -hmm. integrated producer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is what they like to do. Mm -hmm. So what's the European position on this and how do they implement it, if at all? I mean, this, uh, this has been the model of uh, EU model of unbundling, of uh, for forcing large companies to separate, as you mentioned, the production versus distribution capabilities. Uh, and uh, within EU territory, Gazprom has had to unbundle. It was forced to sell off its, um, uh, its arms, uh, you know, the distribution arms. Uh, countries like Ukraine are actually following that as well, even though, you know, they're not members of the EU. Um, to what extent Russia would do that? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I just don't see that as a, with their current government and their current, uh, you know, energy policy. And I, I don't see that as something beneficial to them that they would. Yeah. So I, I, the European Union put it together. Yes. Except they don't implement it. Well, they do in some, they do in some places, but not others. That's yes. That's partly my question yes. because okay. they, they wouldn't sign a deal, for example, yes. with Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I mean, there's been in different instances. Like Opal is another pipeline that, um, at first, uh, you know, the EU regulation somehow didn't apply to Gazprom, and you know, but now there's been a, a recent change where, you know, they're forced to be competitive and allow other gas producers on that pipeline as well. So I mean, I think the EU. I think. Sometimes it has all the right policies, but it's also not necessarily kind of implementing them in all cases. And Germany also has tremendous influence right now within the EU, especially post, you know, well, Brexit, looming Brexit. Um, so while uh, a lot of the other EU countries, for example, have great agreement on Nord Stream 2, still within EU institutions in Brussels, that, fall, you know, that project is still somehow on the cards. I just want to, to make mm -hmm. it straight because I got confused. So once Gazprom or whatever Russian entity enters EU territory, are those rules enforced or not enforced? What's your point? Or sometimes? Uh, you can say sometimes to various, well, sometimes and to various degrees still. I mean, there's an effort to have them to, to be enforced. But I mean, it's been, you know, some unbundling efforts took years, even though the EU was already written into place. Some countries got exceptions, 
or exemptions or delays to implement those rules, you know, citing, you know, national, I don't know, interests or so on. I just got a question of, about the overall sort of scale of the um, international trade in these. So I guess the first part was how the LNG just total trade compares to that to pipelines and the extrapolation of that. And the other part was just how the total amount compares with oil as far as international trade, either mm -hmm. energy equivalents or Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So LNG, in terms of the overall pie of gas trade, is still you know a, a much smaller share. It's uh, you know I, I don't want to give you the because it keeps growing every year, but it's still less than a quarter. You know, um, but gas usage in comparison to oil is actually increasing. I mean, and that's why the International Energy Agency. You know, have declared a few years ago that we're now in an era of gas. Again, because of, in some regards, because it's a cleaner fossil fuel, and now because it's easier to transport. But so, is it getting to the same scale as the oil, or still a lot smaller? Um, I, I don't know the numbers now. Thanks, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I know it's not the uh, same region necessarily, but um, I wondered if we could zoom out to a, a longer term time horizon. I've heard there's competition for gas uh, resources around the Arctic. And as this becomes, uh, as the, the ice cap melts, these oil fields will become available that could potentially favor Russia in a competition with the US. And mm -hmm. right now there's mm -hmm. been some positioning with mm -hmm even underground submarines to mm -hmm. claim. Mm -hmm. Do you see this transforming again, maybe the geopolitics of energy? Well, the great question, and actually I'm thinking, I should have had a slide in there on that, but you know, you can't have a slide on everything. But, uh, you know, very significant in terms of where we're going next and where this uh, com geopolitical competition is shifting to next. Um, uh, certainly the Arctic, uh, certainly during uh, the last, let's say, five years uh, when, uh, or maybe more, when gas prices have been somewhat lower, in part because of the influx of, uh, you know, new gas uh, producers, uh, American or Western uh, energy kind of explorers or producers pulled out from the Arctic because it wasn't perceived as commercially feasible or a favorable time to do so. Russia instead pushed ahead continuously. And I think that to me kind of is the difference when you have energy companies that are being really, that are an arm of the state and are pursuing the state's, uh, you know, geopolitical strategy and have a long-term view versus commercial entities that are just thinking about, you know, quarterly or at best annual, you know, reports to shareholders. And it's, I, I think it's a little bit unfortunate that the U.S. let Russia kind of makes such strong in -hole, uh, inroads there. Uh, the, more than that, you know, Russia has also kind of taken on more symbolic things. You know, they're blasting Russian radio. Uh, they have a radio service all over the Arctic. I mean, I, I don't know to whom, but you know, they've planted, <laughs> they've planted the Russian flag there, and they've brought in more military and troops and personnel to the region. So they're really kind of trying to take on permanent uh, positions. Another player here is China that can, perceives itself as an Arctic state, uh, though it doesn't have a border, you know, on the Arctic, but nonetheless, it perceives itself as an Arctic state. And there, I think it's the Russia-China relationship. Um, that's, you know, I think that they both view as strategic. They know that only together they can kind of outcompete potentially the West or, you know, the Western alliance states for the Arctic. Uh, of course, for China, it's very important because of, you know, trade routes uh, and energy routes and shipping routes. Um, and again, because of China's vast appetite for, for energy, they want to ensure these routes. And of course, Russia is one of their <coughs> providers. Uh, and I would say when it comes to China, why also is gas so important? Uh, if I were, you know, if we were to see today kind of civil unrest or political instability, well, civil unrest in China, it would probably be tied to the pollution issue. And that's why the Chinese government is so concerned. And that's why they're so aggressively pushing ahead to gasify to, you know, in order to reduce pollution, which has become such a really social, major social, and you can almost say political issue. Let me ask a two-finger mm -hmm. question on the uh, Arctic. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, my understanding is that developing Arctic resources, I was at the Stockman field mm -hmm. at one point, hugely expensive. I think I heard Stockman was going to be 40 to 100 billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And in the current situation, <coughs> including with Western sanctions mm -hmm. on Russia, presumably it's much more difficult for Russia to get access to American or Western capital to spread the mm -hmm. risk. And it's also harder for them to get access to Western technology. So can Russia really develop fields in the Arctic on their own? And how, how, how difficult would that well, be? Well, the financing they can get from China, and uh, they already proved that case when they launched Yamal LNG terminal. It's a Russian LNG export terminal that was under direct US financial sanctions. And they completed that project um, with you know, Chinese help. Uh, and uh, more interestingly, for those of you who are interested, one of the initial cargoes of that, Amer of that LNG from Yamal ended up where? Where? Texas, Boston. Boston, Boston. So I wrote a piece about, about that in the New York Times uh, last year during a very cold winter spell. You know, Boston, because it lacks kind of regional infra pipeline infrastructure, had to import gas. And the cheapest gas at that moment was from uh, the sanctioned Yamal. Somehow it didn't make as much of a splash, frankly, as I expected, no. given, you know, energy dominance and so on and on that we hear, you know, all the rhetoric. Kind of going off of that point, mm -hmm. on, uh, you, when, when you mentioned uh, the Ukrainian situation mm -hmm. about import, the mm -hmm. difficulty importing LNG made me think of uh, kind of the Russian geopolitics of, of where the um, where the terminals would be export in, in their aggressive LNG mm -hmm. strategy. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about um, like where those would be located and, mm -hmm. and um, maybe what the, the geopolitics of that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with Russian LNG terminal export terminals, uh, they've been kind of very behind, as I said, on, on that uh, on that front. Uh, but it's you know it's part of their priorities and strategies. So one is the Yamal LNG, which uh, does uh, can access the, those Arctic you know resources, and you know and it's uh, located way up uh, off you know north of Siberia. Uh, another one is the Primorsk LNG terminal, which is on the Baltic Sea, um, and that's. Uh, why this is another kind of uh, signal that Russia really wants to hold on to the European market. I mean, it's seeing that Europe is now turning more to LNG import terminals and Russia is saying, well, well, we'll have, we'll be selling you LNG from our terminal here on the Baltic Sea. Um, Russia and I think LNG will be, you know, priced to be very competitive, uh, particularly to gain inroads in those markets. And I know even, for example, the Lithuanian LNG import terminal that was built on the Baltic Sea it's certainly considering, uh, you know, importing LNG, and maybe it has already had some uh, small deals with uh, Novatech. Uh, Novatech is an interesting Russian energy company to watch. Uh, for those of you who are interested, I mean, it's a privately owned company. It has, um, it launched LNG exports first before Gazprom. Gazprom always was kind of expected that this will be the company that will do it, and they had plans, but somehow they couldn't, you know, get it together in part because they're really, um, you know, they, uh, they have to provide gas to the d Russian domestic uh, sector below market price. So, you know, they're kind of strapped, I guess, for cash, plus with all the corruption and, you know, wh whatever that they do, you know. So versus Novatech has, is very aggressive, very kind of well managed, commercially kind of uh, driven. And I think they will be making big inroads in the LNG market. And are those uh, 12 months of the 12 months of the year accessible um, terminals? Yes. 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 Ice free. Yes. Well, well, uh, uh, Primorsk, Yamal. I'm not. Uh, they have the ice breakers there now. So. Two finger. Uh, uh, two finger on <clears throat> the question you were just mm -hmm. talking about. Um, is are there LNG carriers? in sufficient number <clears throat> that you can just rent one at, when you need it? Or do you have to build up a fleet of carriers as an additional cost item to deal with for Russia to carry the, uh, the LNG? Um, a good point. I Usually I hear more concerns about the, the people who are the receiving, you know, the, on the receiving side, but on the exporting side, um, 
Russia, I know, has built some of their own LNG carriers that are specifically capable for of Arctic type of shipping that also has the ice breaking, you know, functionality tied in. Um, it's, they can also use, though, at the end of the day, not necessarily just their shipping because they're selling the gas kind of on the spot market as a commodity. And another, you know, like for, for example, the, the gas that came to Boston didn't come on a Russian tanker. Um, any bought it on the spot market while the gas was uh, in the UK already at the time. And then they using their carriers, or I don't know, a rented carrier, what brought it to Boston? Um, this is kind of related to some of the previous things. So Arctic again, um, I am curious about this ambiguous relationship that Russia has in relation to climate change. Um, on the one hand, it's good that there might be these new year-round seaports, and that's uh, seen as a positive economic development. But on the other hand, of course, um, the, the melting and the um, extreme weather events that have been taking place with increasing frequency in Russia can be very dangerous. Um, and the recent um, signing on to the Paris Agreement, of course, plays into this. So I'm curious from an energy security perspective, uh, how you see this debate around climate in Russia playing some sort of role, if any. You know, I, I'm a little cynical to what extent Russia, you know, really cares about climate change. And I, I believe the Russian leadership is a little c cynical on that issue as well. So uh, I think if it's, you know, convenient, you know, they, they can sign up to some, some policies and so on. I mean, it's also not, a, you know, a country that cares tremendously for its uh, population and its well-being. So I think would be a little less concerned if the population would have to be relocated because, you know, some areas are flooded or uninhabitable or so on. So, I mean, Russia has been relocating its uh, population since the Tsarist uh, times, really, to wherever it was more expedient for them. Now. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how, because uh, at the end of the day, like, like we're very dependent on infrastructure. So any of, like yeah, on infrastructure, yes. So any new like infrastructure choke points that are happening around the world as energy becomes more global, as we build mm -hmm. more pipelines, like do you think there's a potential for these like choke points, for example, the Panama Canal, mm -hmm. like US LNG to Asia, to become sort of like part of national security concerns? Mm -hmm. You know, similar when like Hormuz is for oil. Yeah, some of this has already been addressed, and um, some uh, the Panama Canal and some other kind of uh, straits have been, in fact, enlarged to accommodate uh, the or allow for for the larger LNG tankers. So, I mean, that's something that has been an issue already because, you know, LNG shipping is not brand, it's not new. I mean, the first, in fact, LNG shipment occurred from the United States to Britain in the early 1960s. But this is kind of the recent boom, you know, boom of it. So, yeah, there, there, these concerns about uh, um, congestion or different issues have been in existence. And I think... Uh, and that's one of the risks I also highlighted that indeed we have more kind of, let's say, infrastructure now to worry about globally. Um, and this is part of America's not only uh, you know, political interest, but also commercial interests as well. So uh, <clears throat> the politics of climate change may not be having much of an effect at this point in Russia, but that's certainly not the case in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know what your view is of the politics of climate change effect on gas production and distribution, uh, and in particular, what the political effect of that will be on the green parties in, in Western Europe in particular, and what impact that might have with respect to all these projects with respect to LNG and mm -hmm. gas production generally. I have a feeling that you could answer this question. <laughs> Do you want to? <laughs> um, you know, uh, p policies really vary from country to country. And even, for example, in within Germany, I mean, Berlin, the city of Berlin has its own uh, climate policy in terms of eliminating uh, uh, gasoline-fueled vehicles, which has had, you know, uh, you know great rever reverberations on, uh, you know, the, the economy and, and so on. 
So uh, I mean, that's why uh, some of this kind of major innovation in transportation fuel and so on today is happening in Germany in order to address this. I mean, you can also say climate change concerns um, or you know green concerns are also having this impact in um, you know because for, again with the gas demand, even the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, for example, uh, its advocates in Germany would say that we need it because. Um, well, well, Germany has essentially also eliminated all nuclear, yeah, nuclear production. So, you know, I think it's, uh, and also maybe this is not like exactly my area, you know, in terms of the cli climate change regulations, but different countries have had, uh, you know, kind of different approaches to it. And sometimes even within a country, different approaches to it. Thanks. I'm just, I'm curious what you advise when you meet with US officials as a, a policy response to this. Um, and are unilateral U.S. sanctions having a policy impact, or are they actually incentivizing these workarounds, as you just mentioned, with Russia and China, which I think is quite significant if that's actually mm -hmm. where this heads. And the GAO just put out a report I haven't read yet about uh, the lack of a policy effect with their use of sanctions. It's been focused mostly on Iran, but I think it also gets into mm -hmm. Russia. I'm just mm -hmm. curious your views mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. what we should be doing. It's a tough one because, it, you know, I think sanctions did have an impact um, on the Russian economy, and coupled with uh, the down, well, with a crash in energy prices, I think it it did hurt Russia. But did it have that full effect? Uh, I mean, it as as I mentioned, you know, they still managed to build uh, Yamal LNG and start exporting LNG. They still made all throughout the sanctions period. They still made. Uh, you know, uh, great inroads in the Arctic. Uh, they continued their development. Uh, and I think they kind of this also, on the other hand, showed that, uh, you know, kind of the world maybe has changed so much in terms of where the economics power lies. I mean, while certainly the you know, US and our Western allies still have a lot of it, you know, a country like Russia can still turn to others. Uh, to do these deals, even while being kind of an outcast and on sanctions with China, with India. And, uh, you know, we have a much less sway in that kind of broader part of the world. Yeah, could you tell us, or update me at least, uh, what's the status of the southern corridor? Uh, mm -hmm. From the producers on the one hand, mm -hmm. pipeline access to Europe on the mm -hmm. other hand, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. role of Turkey in the southern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, Southern Gas Corridor actually launched. Um, um, it was finally built. Uh, so it uh, brings Caspian gas to Turkey. Um, and then onwards, there's through connections through Greece, um, Southern Italy. All of that hasn't been implemented yet. But you know, well, we can hope. We can hope that with time. I mean, this has been such a slow project. That project initially was, you know, you called the Nabucco. I mean, initially was supposed to be the Nabucco, and now it's the Southern Gas Corridor. But uh, you know, the the quantities, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's about 20 BCM right now. Um, you know, not very large. There are plans to expand it. Um, it's, I would say, probably the Southern Gas Corridor matters less today than we thought it would have mattered because of the changes I tr described in the market. So, you know, with the U.S. being such a large producer with LNG shipments, uh, that the, the Europeans have more options today versus, you know, when this was first conceived 20 years ago, this was basically the only option you could come up with for alternative sources of gas. Sure. What is Europe's potential to produce its own unconventional gas? You know, that, uh, that I think there's no consensus on that. Um, some countries do have, uh, re, you know, estimated large reserves of unconventional gas, Poland being one of them, Ukraine. Um, other countries like France have already, uh, you know, said that they would never, never pursue you know, shale gas because of environmental concerns. And moreover, they even tried to implement that they would never import gas that was extracted from shale, um, you know, that will be, I mean, of course, a, you know, a gas molecule is a gas molecule and it becomes increasingly difficult to say whether, you know, it was initially uh, 
you know, created through shale fields. Um, there are a number of issues with Europe. I, I think, and it also varies country to country. I mean, different countries have different uh, appetite, as I would say, for improving their energy security, their perceived vulnerability, their uh, lack, their lack or uh, possession of alternative resources. So I think probably countries in Eastern Europe would have more appetite from, for developing shale than those in Western Europe. Um, but right now also with a kind of slump in, somewhat slump in gas prices, there's been less of an interest in investing in, in this exploration. Uh, and countries have perceived that they can, you know, again, import, you know, LNG from elsewhere. There was also a big propaganda campaign, um, you know, at some point to Russia um, in terms of growing grassroots opposition in Europe to, uh, to fracking. So not in the immediate term, I would say, I don't see it. Um, uh, also, I mean, there's geological considerations. A lot of the fracking success that has occurred in the United States and North America was under different geological conditions. So some of these, let's say, techniques and, and technology can be immediately and directly applied to, let's say, Poland today. Let me ask this question because you've actually described the situation in part due to changes in the global glass market mm -hmm. and in part due to just you know, skyrocketing mm -hmm. American mm -hmm. production and the American ability now to export uh, LNG. It actually sounds you know, fairly favorable to Europe. I mean, the sort of dependency that I, I go back to say 20 years ago, oh, yes. when we were looking and saying it's, there's this horrible potential dependency on the Russians. Yeah. The Russians have this huge potential to inflict pain on the uh, Europeans. At a time when we in the United States were saying, my gosh, we're running out of gas, we're mm -hmm. going to have to build all these facilities to import LNG from the Middle East. I think some of those facilities mm -hmm. that you showed up there yes. were, were built yes. originally to receive gas. Exactly. Now exporting gas. Exactly. Okay, so there's been huge changes just in, you know, 15, 20 years. Putting on your crystal ball, do you see any potential change out there that could then dramatically change the situation where, say, 15 years down the road, you know, maybe the Russian situation uh, is enhanced in terms of its ability to use its energy resources for political purposes? Or is Russia pretty much on a track to either seeing that influence go down or just having to play like a regular market player? I, I would view it more that Russia will have to play as a regular market player going forward. Um, and not just because of you know the booms we've seen with the oil and gas markets, but I think we have other revolutions in store, um, really, I, with renewables, with hydrogen liquids, with, you know, a variety of other, uh, you know, other fuels for, for, you know, transportation and our other energy needs. Uh, a lot of that research is going on in, in Europe, in Germany, in, uh, in Denmark, um, also when it comes to, you know, efficiency and... Uh, um, great progress has been made. So I think energy will become increasingly more of a commodity. And I think countries that were previously energy poor and thus very vulnerable will have now more, let's say, tools or options to produce energy domestically. Uh, I mean, they, not all, of course, if you were never, you know, in the, you, you will not become an oil producer, let's say, but uh, you'll have other alternatives. Last question. Mm -hmm. It's not a good question. It's a kind of a remark because when you're a, and especially a segue to the future, when we think about it, I remember maybe it was 10, 15 years ago, and I forgot the name of the law about the oil supply that we've reached the peak. There mm -hmm. was a big discussion at mm -hmm. the Earth Sciences. There was, you know, peak somebody oil. said, no, peak we, oil, yes. run, we do oil. run out. And <laughs> lo and behold, you know, we are at the same point that we were when somebody said that streets will be impossible because of horse uh, refuse, you know, <laughs> so it, it's just really funny how the world works. I mean, here came a gap out of, to me, out of nowhere. Well, it's... I put Shazara Malketi in Yasa that projected gas to be the next energy future. And he did it in 1970. 1970s. He was still right. Well, it's now, you, you mentioned peak oil, yes. I mean, now it's, uh, when they say peak oil, uh, they're, they're considering peak oil demand. 
that we've reached a peak of oil demand and that oil demand will only uh, continue to decrease. So that's the, the new theory, quite the opposite of, uh, you know, uh, a peak supply. <laughs> Last question. Uh, there was a uh, when uh, the there was the oil crisis <laughs> in the last part of the uh, 20th century. There was a cottage industry in the, uh, among animals an mm -hmm. uh, as to what the global reservoir of oil is like, and of course it's finite. And, and, the, and the guesses as to, given the consumption rates, there were guesses on that, all of them increasing, of course, along with the population. Mm -hmm. When, when was we, were we going to exhaust the oil? And the, the number that I remember were, was always about 50 to 100 years out. And, every, and 50 years later, it was 50 to 100 years <laughs> out. There. Are, in the literature of gas, are there people who are making these guesses on the, what the global reserve of gas looks like? You know, I, there are always, when it comes to estimates, um, you know, there is uh, proven reserves, estimated reserves, extractable reserves, and those figures honestly change, and some of them are even debated, like Turkmenistan is one country. Now, if you listen to their own projections, uh, they probably have enough gas to fuel the whole world forever and ever. <laughs> Others are more skeptical, uh, you know, and the, you know, place their, uh, you know, so proven reserves that are lower. Years <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, please uh, join me in thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.